We have uh, a different sort of equipping hour this morning. Not a, not a sermon, not a lecture, not even an interview. Uh, this is more of a discussion, discussion style equipping hour. I have, my name is Jacob Hantlow, one of the pastor elders here. This is Josh Rosas. He co-leads, or really is the, the functional leader of our Spanish ministry. And what we're going to be doing this morning is giving GBC an introduction to our Spanish ministry. An introduction and explanation to our Spanish ministry that's been meeting faithfully once a month for over a year and a half. Um, but what we want to do is let you know, basically introduce you to what has been going on behind the scenes and make sure that the church body at large knows that Spanish ministry is for them, even if you don't speak Spanish. It's something that, that doesn't merely happen with Spanish speakers in one room, one week of the month, but it's something that is an extension of the ministry of Grace Bible Church, and we want to make sure that Grace Bible Church knows, let's go up to the first slide, what is Spanish ministry, that the Grace Bible Church knows what is going on in Spanish ministry and is involved. So let's get started in prayer, and then I'll, I'll introduce the ministry to you by first talking about what it isn't, and then Josh will speak of what it is. Lord, thank you so much for this body that you've made us a part of, a body with many individual parts, made up of people who even speak a few different languages, equipped differently, each one able to do a different ministry. I'm grateful that we're not all the same. And God, I'm grateful for those among us who speak Spanish and that that experience gives us the opportunity to minister in a unique way. God, I pray for the next 50 minutes or so that you make it clear, that you make it helpful, that it would be encouraging, that it would encourage and mobilize our body, whether we speak Spanish or not, to better reach all of the people in the community around us, uh, especially those who speak Spanish, and then better able to serve, to prefer, to honor uh, those in our body who might prefer Spanish as their first language. God, I pray above all that you would be glorified and honored uh, in this equipping hour and all that flows from it. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is Spanish ministry? Uh, it, it obviously is a, a ministry designed to serve Spanish speakers. It's a, it's a ministry that where we conduct the, the, the time together primarily in Spanish, but it's probably more helpful to start with what Spanish ministry is not. Um, our Spanish ministry is not designed to be a separate church where we have the English speakers do church all together and then the Spanish speakers do church separately. Uh, we, are, we are one body and, and when we have one body and we have people who speak different languages, we have to be creative. Um, and Spanish ministry is, is a recognition that there are people in our body for whom Spanish is their first language. And there are people not yet in our body who we desire to be in our body for whom Spanish is their first language. But there's some capacity or a growing capacity for them to speak English. And so Spanish ministry is explicitly not aiming at being a segregation of the body into parts, one part speaking Spanish and the other part speaking English, but it's an attempt to draw in those who speak Spanish into our body that understandably is a primary English speaking body. Um, so it's not a separate church. It's also not a small group. Right? Spanish ministry is a time in Spanish to draw people into the church and hopefully into your small groups. Spanish ministry, it's not a small group for Spanish speakers, but it's a place where Spanish speakers who are spread throughout the church in various small groups and who gather 
together in a corporate gathering on Sunday morning where, where those who speak Spanish and those who desire to speak Spanish would meet separately, not as a separate church, not as a separate small group, and not even to conduct a separate church service in Spanish, but rather just a chance for us who speak Spanish, who are spread throughout the body in various ministries to gather together to serve in Spanish. So explicitly out front, I, I want to set the vision that it's not what often happens in Spanish ministries, which is a separation or a segregation, um, but it's, it's designed to be a drawing in ministry, uh, not to highlight our differences, but rather to recognize them and then prefer or honor or serve those who speak Spanish. And I'll get into that later, but I, I wanted to set the tone from the, the outset. We are not seeking to make a separate church or even a separate small group. And, and it's important that all of the church, especially those in the Spanish ministry, know that up front. Yeah, thanks for that, Jake. And feel free to chime in as I kind of summarize what the Spanish ministry is currently as, as it stands. Um, in summary, the, the Spanish ministry is really a, a group, a fellowship group, um, with the goal of serving, equipping, and fellowshipping with Christians whose primary language is Spanish. Um, and currently, at the moment, this ministry involves three things. Um, there's a once a month gathering. We typically meet on the third Sunday of every month. That's typically the, the Spanish group meeting days. Uh, the time is 30 minutes after main service, around 1230 is when we meet. Uh, the second component of the ministry involves relationships among Spanish speakers, you know, that have developed organically as time has gone on. And thirdly, um, recently in the last month, we've included a transcription of the equipping hours, main services, and evening services uh, through a service called Polyglossia. Uh, Polyglossia is a AI transcription service that is built by churches and for churches that has the ability to use artificial intelligence to uh, live, live transcribe, transcribe in a live way um, from English to Spanish and to other languages as well. And Jake, if you want to just chime in yeah. on Polyglossia and kind of what our thought process was through that. Okay. We, can you, you uh, pop up the QR code? You guys can go there now. We should be transcribing. Our goal is to have this going on all three services. Um, what we, basically there's, a, there's a, a problem. When you speak Spanish as a primary language, si, si, si hablo ahorita en español, si nada más, si hablamos en, en español para todo este servicio, a lo mejor van a entender algo. Ustedes van a entender algo, pero no, no van a entender la mayoría de lo que, de lo que decimos. If, if we were to switch to Spanish and speak Spanish for the rest of the service, you guys took, many of you took high school Spanish, you'd understand a little bit of what we said, but there'd be some comprehension missing. It, we even do this sometimes on English TV. We, we put a, a subtitle on and you can, you can hear a little bit better. It, it increases your understanding even in your language. But you can understand if you were learning English, it would be very helpful to have English subtitles, especially when Smedley's speaking. He speaks pretty quick with, with some pretty large words. But, but even in just even me speaking slower, not quite as big of words, it's helpful to have English subtitles. How much more helpful would it be than if those English subtitles were translated to Spanish? And that's what we now have going live in the service. So I, I see a couple groups who this would help. One is, is if you're hard of hearing and you want English transcription for yourself, you can have that. You scan that QR code. It's going to be up before the service. It's in the bulletin. You can also go to gbcaz.org slash live and get that. And if you go up to the upper right, where it says you can choose Spanish, and you can see it in both languages, what, what we hope that this accomplishes is to help those who speak Spanish who would come to the service to be a part of our Spanish ministry, where we do gather, we eat together. Josh is going through an exposition of the book of James. So each week there's a, 
verse by verse exposition, and we worship together. David Britton usually leads us in song. That could be some, a time where we serve the Spanish speakers and those who speak English primarily have to undergo the, the difficulty of hearing uh, a message in a language that isn't their preferred. Um, those people would come to, to that service, to, or not to that service, but that gathering and be comfortable. But the reality is the majority of our corporate gathering is in English. And this is a tool that we thought would be very helpful to help them in their process of understanding and even in the process of learning English and being incorporated into an, a primary English church. So this is a tool that we're going to have live. It's not perfect. Uh, it's, it will miss some things in English, and when it misses things in English, the translation to Spanish obviously isn't perfect. But in our experience, we've been using it for almost a month, more than 95%, probably, probably even higher than that, accurate. And uh, it, it, so use it at your own risk, understand that it's not perfect, but it is a, a pretty valuable tool. I actually have even found some great usage. I don't know if you're anything like me, when somebody says a verse and then they turn there and I missed the verse, you can scroll back and see what verse they said. Or during communion, if you're like, shoot, are we supposed to take this alone or together? <laughs> you, can, you can scroll back and check. So there's some, there's some, some cheater tips for us even in English, but it, it helps in Spanish. Um, Josh, was there anything else for what we do uh, as a ministry? Uh, I think that summarizes it all pretty well, and, and thanks for chiming in on, on Polyglossia. You know, it's certainly not a not perfect, but it certainly is a start mm -hmm. in our endeavors to, yeah. you know, serve the Spanish-speaking community, uh, both in our church and the community that's to come. Yeah, long, long term, if we could, we would love to have a live mm -hmm. translation uh, ministry where we would have Spanish speakers translating live into voice. We are not ready to do that. This is a service that, that we can do for now. Also, if there are other languages that you're aware of that would be beneficial in our body, we are able to, um, to activate those. I believe there's a small fee. It's well worth it for somebody to understand. So if there's another language that you know somebody in the body would benefit from, just let us know so that we can activate that. So yeah, some languages include Portuguese, Mandarin, and some others as well. I believe there's a total of seven or eight languages that we could choose from, but you know, just a little plug for, for Polyglossia. Yeah, so do you want to, why, why are we doing Spanish ministry? Yeah, yeah, if we could go on to the second slide there. Um, so the question is, why are we doing this, right? Why are we doing Spanish ministry, and really the answer is because our Lord Jesus has given us a great commission. And if you have your Bibles, I would just invite you to go to uh, Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20 with me. We're just going to be taking a look at these few verses that I know are very familiar to us. And real quickly, as... Um, I had a request from a dear brother here in the church to, to read these three verses, first in Spanish and then English, just to give us the, the experience of what a monolingual Spanish speaker feels when they've been convicted by the Holy Spirit, they're saved, they're looking for a sound church, they find themselves in an area where sound doctrine in Spanish is just scarce, and they come to an, a sound English-speaking church whose services and teaching is in English, um, you know, me reading this in Spanish, kind of flipping the table a little bit, would give you guys an experience of what it's like to, you know, I know just enough English to get by at work or, or X, Y, and Z, but I want to learn the Word of God. So let's just read these three verses. I'll read them in Spanish, and then I'll go, go ahead in English. Mateo 28, versículo 18. 28, versículo 18. Y acercándose Jesús les habló diciendo, Toda autoridad me ha sido dada en el cielo y la tierra. Id pues y hacer discípulos a todas las naciones, bautizándolos en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo, enseñándoles a guardar todo lo que os es mandado. Y aquí yo estoy con vosotros todos los días hasta el fin 
el mundo. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In summary, this is why we're doing this. This is why we're um, endeavoring to develop and to have a Spanish ministry is because we're, we've been given a great commission to go out and make disciples of all the nations. And there's men, women in this church with a willingness and the ability to gather in Spanish. There's men who have the willingness and the ability to teach in Spanish. And, you know, we would like to create just a, a place for these disciples to come and to be equipped and to live out the Christian life uh, with other Christians. So, Jake, would you want to chime in on that? Yeah, the, the reality is God has placed Grace Bible Church in a city in Phoenix that has a lot of people who speak Spanish. A lot of people who only speak Spanish and even more who prefer to speak Spanish. Um, we are a church that strives to be well-equipped to go and make disciples. And there are some of us who are able to go and make disciples of people in Spanish. But like Josh said, what, what do we do? If, if a Spanish speaker comes to Christ, we have a problem. And we, we saw this uh, a couple of years ago. There was a Spanish speaker here who came to church every single week and felt like an outcast. We, we knew that there was something that we had to do. There has to be a way. We've drawn in. How are we going to build up if we don't have anything even approximating a formal ministry to help build up in Spanish? We had a problem, and we wanted to create more problems. We wanted to go out into the community and make disciples. And also, God has believers here in the city, like Josh said, who speak Spanish and are longing for, looking for a solid church, a doctrinally sound church that preaches the word to be involved in. There's a problem. How do we fix it? Uh, we... Spanish ministry is our effort at fixing this. It's, it's not all that it could be, not all that it should be, but it's our meager effort to have a place to invite these Spanish speakers in and to equip them in Spanish. Josh is going through a, uh, like I said, an exposition of James. We have taught through uh, the gospel tract that we have at the front desk. I don't know if you've noticed at the welcome stand out front, there is the gospel, and then there's a tract right next to it, El Evangelio. It's translated into Spanish. Um, what, what do we do? So we've taught through that to equip, um, and we also are continuing that to t try to draw into the church at large and to normalize and to make the whole body aware of this significant subset of our city that we might not be reaching, that we need to reach, that we need to pray for, that we need to be avail available for. So the Bible calls us to genuine love in the body of Christ. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time in this passage at the women's retreat. If you were there, you, you know it. Uh, Romans 12, um, 12 verse 9. The, the context here is... You can turn there, Romans 12, verse 9. That we who are many, in many different pieces, are one body. God has fit together this one body with many members who do not all have the same function, do not all have the same gifting, do not all have the same ability, but he in his wisdom has fit it together exactly as he has seen fit. And in our body, he has seen fit to put some servants here, some members of our body who speak Spanish. And many of us don't. 
What does genuine love look like in our body? Verse 12, verse 9. One of the things that that looks like is verse 10. Brotherly love to one another. Uh, Treating each other like family. Outdoing one another in showing honor. And uh, we, we uh, spent a long time on this, seeking to show hospitality, verse 13, at the, uh, at the retreat. What does loving with a brotherly love and honoring one another? We could think of Philippians 2.14, in humility, counting others as more significant than yourself, just like Jesus did. What does that look like when one of the people in the body doesn't speak your preferred language, doesn't speak, uh, it's more comfortable for you to speak English. What does it look like? How can you honor them? How can you count their needs as more significant than your own? You can do the embarrassing thing of making mistakes in their language. You've heard, I, I have... I, by God's grace, I, I married Kiki, who grew up in Mexico. She told me I had to learn Spanish before she'd marry me. So I, I understand it pretty well. I speak it okay. I have an accent. I sound dumb in Spanish. I can show honor, true love, genuine love to Spanish speakers by being the embarrassed one, recognizing that for them, every other time they come to service, they're in that position. Do you see how, how we can actually, in, by, by doing a ministry like this and even setting the norm, setting the command for the church, if you speak Spanish at all, embarrass yourself. Come to this ministry, make the mistakes. Even more than that, do the hard work to prefer them to learn their language. Um, it's a, our Spanish ministry is, is a, an effort to remove barriers to fellowship, to prefer others in true love. Um, be hospitable as a church. If you were having a guest over and their preferred language was Spanish and you had the ability to speak in that language, you probably wouldn't demand that they speak your language in your home. True hospitality, true brotherly love to that, to that individual, inviting them into your home as if they were your family member or inviting them into our church as a true, important, honored part means that, that we ought to do some hard work and as far as we can, um, make them feel welcome, honored, preferred. Uh, it recognizes the oneness of the body of Christ. Even just like Jews and Greeks, culturally, just in every way, very different. Ephesians 2, 14, God brought them together into one body. We're in a city and there's significant differences among people in this body, significant differences among people in our church. And when God has brought us together into one body and broken down all of those differences and made us one, one family, one body, um, united us together, uh, we ought to do everything we can to minimize those external differences and to express the reality of that oneness. And we can do that through preferring one another in language. Uh, the, the early church likely had similar problems, and God supernaturally dealt with those in some ways. Um, but God, from the very start of the church, knew that the church couldn't be a monolingual thing. If you don't speak Greek, you don't get the gospel, right? He accomplished that in Acts 2. Uh, as Peter's preaching, right, miraculously people heard, they said, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, visitors from Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretans, Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So whether they, they spoke Aramaic or Greek or 
or whatever, the gospel went out. God did that miraculously. And then in that early church, through tongues and translators, and now we can use it, do it through polyglossia, Spanish ministry. But the reality is we cannot keep the gospel to our tongue only. Uh, we want all the nations to hear the gospel and then not merely be saved, but then be able to make disciples disciple making disciples. My prayer is that this little once a week thing of Spanish ministry will quickly become insufficient and we have to do something much bigger, um, much more systematic. But for now, I wanted the church to know the what and the why of, of what Spanish ministry is. And it's not just these people that meet in the corner uh, once, a, once a month and if you don't speak Spanish, you don't have a part. It's actually part of the drawing in, building up, sending out ministry of Grace Bible Church for all of us. Is there anything you want to add to that or go into who's involved? I believe we could go on. Thanks, Jake. If we could go on to the third slide. So who's involved in the Spanish ministry? Um, from a leadership perspective or a core team, if we don't call it a core team, but you know the, the men that that seek to organize and to put on the Spanish ministry. Uh, Jake Hanla, so he's the elder, fearless leader overseeing the ministry. Uh, David Britton as well. Unfortunately, he was not able to join us today um, due to sickness last minute, but he usually leads the music um, during our worship time at our once a month gathering, and he's been doing a, a great job at, at leading that effort. And there's myself as well. So over the last year and a half, I believe I've done about 70% of the teaching load. And, and like we alluded to a little bit ago, we initially started to go through the gospel tract in Spanish. Uh, many of you know that Grace Bible Church has a gospel tract that is available at the front table in the lobby. Um, that gospel tract has five points. Um, recently, that gospel tract was translated by, I believe, you and Kiki into Spanish. There was some, Carla helped a lot and Carla Walker helped a lot translating that gospel track into Spanish. And at our once a month meeting, we began going through that gospel tract um, one point at a time. And really that was essentially a, a five point series on the gospel. Um, so, you know, I taught at a trust level level in Spanish uh, through each of those points. And once th that got done, Earlier this summer, we started going through the book of James verse by verse, where again, you know, I'm thankful that my pastors have equipped me with the uh, skills that are taught at the trust, uh, where I'm able to really apply what Smed has taught me in the Spanish language and do that for hopefully the benefit of those that listen in Spanish as well. So aside from us three, um, there's of course the Longoria family, there is the Rios family who are, who are members and are, are really involved in the ministry, uh, Marisol as well, Kiki Hanla plays a large portion when, when it comes to the food and the potluck, you know, that's, that's always a, a blessing and there's many others that are involved like Carol and Haley and Matthew as well, that um, their presence is very, very much appreciated and encouraging, um, especially when we have Spanish speakers come in from the community every now and again. So. Yeah, something that's encouraging, you should be encouraged, is not everybody in that list speaks Spanish really well. Uh, some very well. And there's a lot that you didn't mention. Um, it's, it's a rotating, rotating group. Um, I would encourage you, if you speak Spanish at all, one of the benefits of what Josh has done with the Gospel Tract and then uh, in James is it helps you if you listen to understand, to start to get gospel words, theological words. If, if you generate, like me, I use Spanish every day at work. I know all the medical words. Um, it's very helpful to sit under a gospel, to, to go through a gospel tract, to go through verses. And now the words that are so important to our theology in English, you start to get in Spanish. And we practice just speaking normally about the most important things we could talk about in Spanish together. So just as a, a language builder in that, that's not the main purpose is to build language, but if, if you are building language, you can certainly come and listen and grow. Definitely. And just to speak to the participants or people who are able to participate, literally anyone is able to participate. 
right? Anyone with the ability and willingness to understand and speak Spanish is of course welcome, all members of GBC included. Um, the, the one thing to mention is that the intent is to have the gathering be in Spanish, again, to prefer those that are uh, Spanish only speaking or Spanish heavy speaking, you know, with limited English. Um, over the last year, like Jake alluded to just a little bit ago, we've had the following types of people attend. Um, we've had members and regular attendees of Grace Bible Church who are bilingual. Um, we've had people come from the community through either invites or they just come and check out the English service, but they have, you know, family members in Spanish that end up inviting them to our monthly meeting as well and all of this sort. So mm -hmm. that's all I got to say for that. Yeah. So uh, what do we do? Uh, we, we meet once a month in the Wellspring Room. You're welcome to do it. If you are going to be a part, there's a church center group. Let us know so we make sure we have enough food. Um, and what I, what I really encourage you to try to be involved is to bring a Spanish speaker and then be involved. If there's a, a coworker or a neighbor or somebody who, who you know has had a hurdle to being involved in church, hey, I'd love to be a part of your church, but the English thing gets me. The idea is for you to invite them, have them join you in Spanish ministry, get to know people in the church, and then uh, hopefully be involved outside of Spanish ministry. So that, that, is, that is the how. It's really logistically pretty simple, and, um, and the how flows from the, the why and the what. Um, Josh, how, how should this affect Grace Bible Church in your mind? Prayer. Um, like we just read a few minutes ago, you know, the, our Lord has given us a great commission to make disciples of all nations. Um, there's certainly men, women, willing and able to fulfill that. Um, and really what we ask is for prayer, uh, for prayer, for wisdom and guidance and boldness and pro proclaiming the gospel and not only that, but also equipping the saints for the work of ministry um, here at GBC at large. Mm -hmm. That's what first comes to mind. Yeah, I, I hope it also makes you more aware of the Spanish speakers around you. Um, I think that that's been, to my shame, a significant benefit of this to me has been uh, going to places where I might go eat or even co-workers. I've had gospel targets, people I pray for. And until we started Spanish ministry, this is to my shame. This is a confession. But I, I pray the effect would be similar for you. Is I speak Spanish with people all day, every day at work. Not one of them, this is tragic, not one of them had been on my prayer list of people that I am praying for to reach the gospel, to reach with the gospel. It was easy for me to connect English speaking coworkers. I want to preach the gospel, invite them to church. And yet every day I'm speaking Spanish at work with coworkers. And until we started Spanish ministry, in my foolishness, in my sinfulness, I didn't have those Spanish speakers on my radar of people to pray for, people to evangelize, and to even invite to church. That's changed for me personally since we started Spanish ministry. I, it would be my prayer that that changes for everybody in the church. We have so many connections in the community, and I suspect if me even being bilingual was that short-sighted on targets of evangelism in Phoenix, um, you might be as well. And that knowing that we are doing this ministry, it, it would broaden your horizons of who you pray for, who you want to uh, share the gospel with, and, and who this church should be aiming to reach. Um, so I also hope, my hope is that, that if, if this accomplishes, if God does what we're praying for, that our church will have more and more people whose preferred language is Spanish, who are here in the service, and it might be awkward for you because you can tell that they don't they have a hard time in English. Hopefully, you have these people in your small group, 
and it creates a little bit of a difficulty where you might need to slow down, you might need to recap, you might need to uh, give somebody a chance to quickly translate for them some concept that was hard, that you don't view that as a hurdle, but a praise God. Um, I really hope that we get that problem to where we have to... Um, all of us together, not just in Spanish ministry, learn how to prefer one another when it comes to languages. And so knowing that this is going on, uh, hopefully you, when you start to see Spanish speakers, you don't think, oh, that's for those people over there. But, oh, this is what our whole church is aiming at. Let, let me do my part, even if I don't speak Spanish, to help draw them in and be as welcoming as possible and connect them with those who I know might be able to serve them better. So uh, I really do pray that this ministry becomes a mark of GBC. Not, I don't, not that we become a Spanish speaking church. Maybe, maybe there will be something long term. Maybe we get, have such a problem that we need part of our story that we all sing half a, we sing a song in Spanish or we have transcription up on the wall or li maybe it becomes a problem to where we need to do something more out front, much more formal. Probably not. But I do pray that it becomes a mark of Grace Bible Church, that we aren't so English focused just because that's who we are and who we're comfortable, that we leave a huge part of our neighbors unevangelized, undiscipled, uncared for. So I wanted to open it up for questions. We don't have to fill the whole equipping hour time. Um, really, our, our ministry is sort of simple, but I wanted, this, like I said, this is an introduction and an explanation for what I hope is a key part of Grace Bible Church and that without a session like this, it might be hard to explain to the masses. Does anybody have any questions, uh, comments for us to, to discuss over, over anything Spanish ministry? Yes, Jonathan. Jonathan asked, if you speak English, not Spanish, and desire to attend, is there a chance to have the translation flipped during the service? Not currently, because it has to go into a magic box that's connected to the internet, and it has to have a sound system, and right now, we don't do that. If that would be, I, I think it's doable, though. If, if you come and you're just like, hey, I want to do this, but it's, uh, I don't speak any Spanish, um, I, I think that we, we probably could flip that. Um, what I would encourage is people who speak just a little bit. If you had, did you have high school Spanish at all? Yeah, like that's probably enough to get you started. And then it, this was something I meant to talk about. If, if you speak just a little bit of Spanish, you're like, man, this... This sort of whets my appetite. I want to learn more. Uh, there are podcasts in Spanish. Even if you listen to them and you're like, I have no idea what's, what's being said. There's good church history podcasts through um, Ligonier. Ligonier. Uh, a lot of the, the Grace to You stuff is translated to Spanish. Um, there are audio Bibles in Spanish. Uh, something that you'll see a lot of us doing is having bilingual Bibles to where you have your English and Spanish. We actually have them uh, at the book table. You have the NASB and the LBLA, the La Biblia de las Americas, uh, bilingual Bible, both on the same page. And that when you are reading the Bible, you can go back and forth and catch the words and then just hear it. So... Yes, anyway, that's a long answer. We, it, it is technically feasible. It's not done. Um, it, we, I want to think more about that. But I don't think it's totally necessary for you, if you have a high school level of Spanish, to come in 
And a lot of times, even in the lessons, Josh, David, or myself, as we teach, we will, on important points, repeat it in English, knowing, knowing that the audience isn't 100% um, pure Spanish. We know the, the audience there. Eric. Are we planning on having the translation available for Build and Wellspring? Build is very easy. Uh, build, we could do that. Uh, if there is a need, if Build and Wellspring leaders, if you're aware, especially well, if you're aware that there is a need for your room to have that, it, it, that is certainly feasible to be done. Um, so know that we have that technology. The only thing that it needs is uh, the hardware and an internet connection and a sound box. So it, it's, it's doable. Um, Daniel's back there saying, oh no, this is making more work. But it's, it's doable. Uh, we just need some heads up and, and, and want to know that there's a need. So if there's a need, please let one of us know. Yeah. Um, Repeat the question. Yeah, you're on. Yeah, Adam asked um, uh, for any recommendations on how to better your Spanish beyond what you learned in high school. Was that the question, Adam? Yeah. Um, attempting to read out loud um, in high school, if you got to the ability to read simple sentences in Spanish. Um, one thing that'll help you, not only in your comprehension, but also in your pronunciation, is getting children's books and attempting to read them out loud in Spanish. Uh, that's something that has helped both me and my wife as well. Um, when you get to the point where you can start to digest more and more complex literature, like the Bible, for example, um, one thing that I started to do about two and a half years ago is to read my Bible out loud you know, for the sake of gaining that vocabulary, perfecting the pronunciation, um, and really just learning how to communicate God's word in Spanish, right? So I think that would be a good start um, if you're by yourself, right? The second thing, and I think a more ideal thing, is just immersion. You know, find um, friends that are Spanish speakers, preferably ones that are Spanish-only speakers, and just hang out with them. You know, try to converse with them, try to understand what they're saying, um, and just try to, you know, communicate what's on your heart and mind on that. That's the, um, by what I have experienced, the way to acquire a second language most effectively is by immersion. Um, Spanish is my first language. I didn't learn English until kindergarten, you know. And I remember it was almost a horrible experience. My mom dropped me off first day of kindergarten not knowing a lick of English, you know, but by God's grace, you just learn with time, so, yeah. Yeah, that was, I was in that boat in love with this girl whose first language, street language was Spanish, and she said, you need to learn Spanish, and so it was immersion. Um, some of the things that were very helpful uh, was if you're watching TV, watching a movie, change the audio to Spanish. If you're in the car, listen in Spanish. Even if you're like, I'm, I'm not understanding, it just sounds like one blend of words. Your brain starts to pick those things out. Um, watching my, my daughter, this is a, I want to just boast in her, watch, she's been taking Spanish classes, but in Spanish ministry, realizing, oh, there's a gospel outlet. There is a sanctified reason for me to learn this language better. Uh, to watch her just take every opportunity and to do what she hates to do. She hates I'm talking about her right now. To, she, to, to get embarrassed, like I said, and make the mistakes. Just try, get yourself in every situation you can and try to speak Spanish. Purposefully go to a restaurant where you might need to speak Spanish and try. Even better, go to a park where you anticipate that there will be Spanish speakers, especially if you're a parent with kids, and see if you can get relationships started, just get life on life. Um, and then there are cool tools. Uh, we use, what's it called, Spanish? Homeschool Spanish Academy. Um, it's like $8 or $9 for an hour. 
of live lessons with a teacher in Guatemala. <laughs> like it's just first language. It's, it's you can go on and, and Zoom course. I, I think it's Google Meet and just take courses. So so there are tons and tons of options um, that are available. But immerse yourself. Doing a course once a week isn't going to help. But just immerse yourself, and then be willing to make mistakes. Um, come to Spanish ministry. That's a that's a good good start. Cesar. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sure you've touched on this topic already, but what, what's the church's first goal in terms of uh, interpreting the message? Is it through to Spanish speaking folks? Is it through headset on stage interpreters? Yeah. So, uh, question is, what's our what's our goal for interpret for translation for live audio translation? Um, first would be accuracy, the ability to do it accurately and consistently. Uh, we've talked about that. So that's coming out. We've talked about that as a ministry. Could we do this? Um, the, the hurdles have been, um, can we do it well to where it's accurate? Can we do it consistently to where you can count on it being there every week? Um, and then there is a, a third consideration where mo the two of the most fluent Spanish speakers in the church who'd be able to have um, English, to, who'd be best equipped to go English to Spanish live are, are female. And the question is, a, a consideration is a proclamation of God's word from the pulpit and, and God's commands in scripture about about that being a clear male leadership role. We, there's questions uh, regarding uh, how that would, would play out, how that, what the appropriateness of um, Kiki and Carla are probably our two best live translators. So with all of that, I think it's a work, in, it's something that we would desire to do. If God were to bring a consistency of, of men who, who'd be able to do that. So for you, practice. Listen to the sermons and practice trying to keep up. It's really hard. But if you could do that, you'd, you'd be on the short list of people. Um, we would love to have that be a ministry. I think that would be better than subtitles. The, the subtitles is because it's better than nothing. It actually meets, I think, the needs of some English speakers who, who are hard of hearing. Um, help catch up and, and it, it meets a gap. It's not our final goal. So our, we would love to be able to have live translations like there are at many, at many churches. I feel like we're not there yet. And that would be headset, um, probably a recorder in the prayer room, a live audio bust in there and, uh, live translation, even with a little language helper next to them, feeding words that, you, they they know are are a challenge. Uh, I, I know there's a number of people who are practicing actively that process. We're just not there yet. question is, uh, Spanish isn't merely a language, but does have a culture associated with it. Are we, do you need to be aware of learning a culture as you're learning a language? Um, my initial thought on that is, yes, there, you, you need to, to love people, not demand that they adopt your culture. And Spanish is not a monolith of culture. Mexicans are very different than Guatemalans, very different than Argentinians, very different than Spaniards. Um, so it, you, you meet the people in front of you. Just like in English, there is a variety of cultures in English that would walk through the door. And uh, there's an appropriate way to honor that. And that doesn't even mean that you need to adopt their culture. It's just right in our model of how do you prefer them, 
How do you honor them? How do you truly love them? Uh, recognizing cultural differences is significant. That, but that does ring with me. Kiki, you guys know one Kiki, which is the English Kiki. And those of you who speak Spanish know the other Kiki. She's different. <laughs> You change languages and you change. I'm looking around. There's, there's other people who I know are, are by Carla. Yeah, she's different in Spanish. You know that there are, there are people who change their culture when they change their language. And I think you even get a glimpse of it in there. It's, it's a little more huggy. It's a little more lovey. It's, a little, it's more normal to eat together, a little more aggressive. Do you have anything to say? I don't. I think you summarized it all pretty well. Um, but yeah, I, to, to agree with you, I, I do believe that there is definitely value in understanding the culture of the surrounding Spanish speakers in the community. So it's good to have that sensitivity, that awareness. Yeah. And even the, the surrounding Spanish speakers are very not monolithic in culture. You have Spanish speakers who've been here. You have Spanish speakers who are new immigrants. You have Spanish speakers who are Spanish because they live in a primarily Spanish American community versus having come from another country. Um, and, and even just differences between Guadalupe versus Phoenix, significant. So it, it, it's a complex and, and not even our primary goal. I think it would just fall under honor the individual, love the individual, and recognize that, that, that that's there. Are we doing it right? Is that okay? <laughs> All right. I know you do a lot of thinking in that regard, so if, if you need to inform us, please, please come chat. Any other questions? All right, Josh, you want to close us in prayer and we'll go, go have some coffee and fellowship. Yeah, absolutely. Hunt hospitality for those of you who know what that means. <laughs> let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that you've granted us to gather together on a Sunday morning and to give this update introduction, this update slash introduction to the Spanish ministry. Lord, I pray that you may help us acknowledge that this is your ministry. And Lord, I pray that you may help us be wise stewards of that. I pray that you may help us as a body uh, be aware that this is a need that there are Spanish speakers that need your word and that need a church home to be equipped to live the Christian life. I pray, Lord, that you may give us wisdom, give us humility, give us zeal and boldness uh, to do just that, Lord. Help us make disciples of all nations. Thank you, Lord. I pray that you may bless the rest of this service and the rest of the Sunday. In your name I pray. Amen.